Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 20. My name's Andy. This is all about testing. Uh, it's another video just on stuff you need to know to be able to write uh, test code day to day. So we're going to look at how to test for correctness with unit tests, integration tests, and we'll very briefly look at benchmarks, but we'll talk more about that next time. So unit tests. Unit tests, um, as you may already know, uh, tests that check that code works and normally they test like a small bit of code, like a unit of code. Um, uh, in Rust, um, when we talk about unit tests, we normally mean little uh, tests that live right next to the code that you're writing. So quite often we put it in the actual same file of code as the code you're testing. Um, but they can uh, also live in a file like next to them if you prefer that. Um, they often test like one function or, or um, like one kind of story of how to use this bit of code. Um, and to run your tests uh, in in Rust, you just type cargo test, and that will run all your different types of tests, including your unit tests. Um, and what normally happens is that uh, cargo will swallow the output from your tests, like standard output and stuff, um, unless the test fails. If the test fails, it'll print it all out for you. So that's normally what you want, right? Like if the test passes, then you don't need to see what, what it printed out. Um, but if it fails, you do. Um, but if that's not working for you, for example, if your test is kind of freezing up and never actually failing, you might want this little tip here. Um, cargo test minus minus and then minus minus no capture. So the reason for this minus minus, by the way, is actually something that is worth knowing, which is that um, the way this works, the way that your tests get run, is that um, Cargo scans through all of your test, all of your code, finds everything that is a test, which we'll see how that gets marked in a second, um, and then it builds them all into a separate executable file, uh, which is so, which is built inside your target directory, just like if you built a main method or something like that. Um, uh, and then it and then it runs it. So Cargo Test actually builds that executable file. Well, searches your code, finds the tests, builds the executable file, and then runs the test all in one. But if you want to pass arguments to the executable to say um, behave slightly differently from normal, uh, this is how you need to do it. The minus minus says like stop passing things to Cargo and start passing it to the the underlying executable that you've created, and then minus minus no capture goes to that executable. So that's why that looks like that. Can be useful for other things as well. Okay, so let's look at an example um, of how you write these unit tests, or the normal way that you write unit tests in Rust. Um, so here's a function called slice swap items. Takes in a slice, takes two indices, the first and the second. And then we can see the implementation of the function here, but in a way it doesn't matter. Basically, we swap over the thing that's at the second index with the thing that's at the first index, like so. Um, and then we're going to write some tests for it. So the way we write tests is we make a module normally called test. doesn't have to be called tests, by the way, but it's normally called tests. And then we set it so that it only compiles when Cargo is in, like, test mode. So the way you do that is you do hash for one of these, like, compile time directives, and then kufug to say this, this, the configuration, like, I guess the kind of world in which this should be compiled is the test world. So this has to be test. This, this word here has to be test, whereas this is just whatever name you choose to give this module, which is quite often tests. Um, and then if you want to test stuff, you need to bring it in, because this is a separate module. If you remember the modules, in order to use code inside modules, you need to bring in the stuff that you're, you're going to use. So in this case, we brought in this function, slice swap items. Yeah, quite often I do use super colon colon star and bring in everything in the containing module. I don't know if that's bad style or not, but... Um, it, it works okay for me, basically, to say, when I'm testing stuff, I want everything that's in this containing module. Um, it's worth noting that because this module is inside this main module, you can use private stuff. So this is not a public function, this swap, this slice swap items, but you can still use it in here. So these unit tests can, like, slightly look into kind of the internals of your code. Um, if you don't like having your test right next to your code in the same file, you definitely don't have to. You can put this module somewhere else in a in a file next door called, I don't know, my slice tests .rs or something like that. It works the same basically. If you have this config test on it, just say only compile this um, uh, if we're in kind of test mode, and then you mark your tests with this hash test thing, this annotation, 
that's what tells Cargo this is a test and therefore you need to uh, run it when you, when I say Cargo test. And this config test is what tells it only compile it when you're in test mode. Okay, so what does the test look like? Well, it just looks like a function that takes no arguments, has this hash test before it, and then it just runs some code. So here we're making an array, and then we're calling the function that we're testing. Um, and saying swap over the thing at index one with the thing at index four, passing in a, a mutable slice of that array that we created. And then we have this assert eek. Um, you, you also have just assert, which you might have seen already. Um, assert eek means assert that these two things are equal. So basically assert that this array, which has now been modified, equals this array that we're creating right here, where the one and the four have been swapped over. So um, assert eek is what you normally use. Sometimes you might just use assert exclamation mark and then say like this array contains this or you know something like that. Um, I'm sure there are modules which give you more sophisticated assertions, but um, they're not commonly used, these kind of assert contains and things like that. Uh, they're not available in the standard library at least. So um, Rust code tends to be um, lean towards just assert eek for checking that things come out the way they, they look. You th that can get a bit hairy, like if one side is an array and one side is a vec, um, it, it, it can be not quite as easy as you might like to compare things, but um, usually you can do, like use a temporary variable or call some function on it to kind of transform it into the same form as the other side. Um, sometimes assert eek will be clever enough. For example, it can convert, compare a string with a uh, reference to a str um, without you having to tell it to do anything special. Um, yeah, that's about assertions. Um, and then you can also do things like check that things should panic. So you still say hash test, but then you can add some extra annotations like should panic. And there's also a way of saying, um, if you look up the documentation for should panic, you can say what, um, I think you can see, say what kind of message should be printed. Um, oh no, that maybe that should be, maybe that's, you can also say that things should um, return an error as opposed to an okay. Um, because your test function can return result. Um, so there's lots more to learn about testing. We are doing a very brief, shallow look at it. But basically, you can say things should panic. Um, for example, if you make an array with five things in it, and then you say swap index one with index six, it should panic. Why should it panic? Quick uh, exercise. Well, it should panic because getting the second thing out of the slice um, will fail because there is no index six in this array. Yeah, that's because the last index is index number five, which is that one. Okay, so that's how you write unit tests, and then those will those will run relatively quickly, um, and they will be just generally the tests that are inside this config test in this inside this mod test should be testing just things that are in the uh, surrounding module. That's your normal way of doing things. Um, if you want to write some tests that, that test multiple modules. Um, you can just put a test file next to your normal files inside that source directory, and they'll execute the same way that these tests execute, which means they'll all get built into that one executable, which has access to private stuff inside this crate. And in contrast, there's this other style of tests, which um, when you're early in your Rust career, you're probably going to overuse. So, right, so um, exercise some caution here. So... The way you make integration tests, which are tests that are supposed to check the external interface of your crate and maybe do more um, bigger operations that, that test across like the whole operation, uh, the external API of your crate. So doing um, just bigger operations, uh, hence the word integration tests. Um, the way you do those types of tests is you put them in a separate directory. So before the previous tests we were looking at would have been inside this module or maybe in a module just next to them, all inside source. Those would all be so-called unit tests, as in they run fast. They're all built into one executable. Um, integration tests go in this separate directory called tests. Um, and then every file in here is its own main method. It builds into a separate executable. And all the code inside here has to import the, the code from here as if it, this was a completely separate crate. So it only uses the external API of your crate, and you get one executable for every file inside this test directory. And that means you spend a lot of time linking those files. And there are various people on the internet saying the best style for this is that you should actually only ever have one test file in here, and then you should call separate tests inside it. Um, the way that you can have reusable code inside here, which you may well want, 
um, is that you have a subdirectory inside tests. You can have a subdirectory, and then inside there, you can have some uh, modules uh, uh, which you contain reusable code, and then your your executables can use those modules. Um, and they won't the modules themselves inside subdirectories won't get treated as tests. It's only things that in this top level directory that are assumed to be tests um, by the integration test setup. So consider just not having any of these until you really need them. Put all your stuff inside source. Those are the tests that run fast, don't take ages linking, stuff like that. When you want tests that actually test the external API of your code um, as if they're completely separate, um, like someone else using your your crate, then put them in here. Consider only having one of these executable files in here. Uh, when you do make reusable code, it's very easy to get warnings about unused bits of reusable code. If, two, if you have two different tests that only use some of your reusable code each, it can get quite annoying. So um, maybe just stick all your integration tests in, in one file in here if you need them. Um, or read more. There's lots of people ranting on the internet about how it's not quite right. Um, short answer, do most of your stuff in this unit test style until you see a need for this kind of separate, big, uh, heavy integration test. Um, okay, another place you can write tests, which we've already seen, um, and the last video is you can write tests in inside your documentation. So you can use this assert eek, um, and if you put uh, three backticks like this, this means this is like a code example. You can also write three backticks rust if you like here, put the word rust on the end. Um, and then you can see inside, in the documentation that gets rendered into HTML, you won't see this line because it starts with a hash, but it's needed to actually make this, this thing work. So if you put examples in your code, um, and they don't compile, then cargo test will fail, right? So make sure they compile by putting in lines like this that actually import the stuff that's needed. Notice, by the way, this is like, again, treating this code as if it's completely outside your crate. So you need to bring in, uh, you need to import stuff as if you're in a completely separate crate because these doc tests get built into a, another separate executable. And again, by the way, can be a bit slow because they're linking. So um, you can look up the command line for running cargo tests without running the doc tests, which do run by default. If you only want to run the doc tests, you can do cargo test minus minus doc like this. Um, and this code will execute. And if it fails, it'll tell you. Um, really great to know that your documentation is correct, as I said in the last video, uh, and also nice to just add some extra tests from, from the outside. It can be a bit slow, so consider not executing it every time you run a cargo test, which I can't remember the command line for, but um, if you do cargo test minus minus help, you'll be able to find it. Um, okay, uh, so that was test, really, really quick run through that. Tests are like uh, incredibly important and good, writing good tests is incredibly important in uh, all coding, so uh, I've got loads more to say about tests, and maybe I'll do some a whole video series about um, how to write good tests at some point. But let's move on to benchmarks. So benchmarks um, are used to test the performance of code, and, and so maybe sometimes make sure it hasn't gradually slowed down over time, or something like that, or just that particular cases uh, are not going wrong because of some something we've forgotten to consider in our uh, thinking about our code's performance. So benchmarks are basically a way of uh, timing executing something lots and lots of times. Um, and there's a command cargo bench, which will run all your benchmarks. And I think all your benchmarks live in a directory called benches, um, like next to source and tests. Um, and as it says here, good benchmarking is hard. Um, sometimes your code gets completely optimized away by the compiler because you, you said do this operation lots and lots of times and the compiler was like, yeah, but you never get any output from that. So why do I even need to bother and just remove it? Um, also be aware that like setting up your test might be the majority of the time. That's what initialization overhead is. Um, so you need to make sure you're timing the right part. Um, and then the last bullet point, be sure your benchmark is representative is kind of a very dark art, right? Like it, the whole point of a benchmark is it's not running your real, um, workload because, um, if it were, you could just run your real workload to find the answer. So a benchmark is supposed to figure out how fast something is. Um, without it taking quite so long as the real world. Um, so it's hard to find good benchmarks. Um, it takes a lot of practice, stuff like that. So um, in the next video, we're going to run through the exercises for this section, and there'll be more stuff on benchmarks. Okay, so the last three videos have been just kind of like stuff you need to know to get your um, your Rust code up and running. So how to create a new 
uh, application or a library, um, how to use modules and workspaces to divide stuff up, um, how to make a good API, or what a good API looks like. And we talked about this unsurprising, flexible, and obvious thing. Have a look back at the previous video for that. And then this time we looked at how to test and benchmark your code. Um, so I hope you're having fun getting on um, with writing Rust code. We had some really tough um, uh, and how, understanding how the language works, what traits are, stuff like that, videos. Then we had a bit of a more relaxing time figuring out just how to like set up your project, write tests, write nice APIs. Um, soon we're going to dive back into um, some of the even more advanced bits of the Rust language, which is hopefully going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but next video, um, we're going to be running through some exercises based on that stuff we've learned recently. Um, make sure you subscribe to these videos. Um, check out um, all my other videos on Diode Zone or on YouTube, and see you next time.